Welcome to part one of the formation of cyclohexene experiment. To get started, we're going to look at the table of reagents. So looking at the molecular weight for cyclohexanol, hopefully you're pretty comfortable with this by now. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just type in cyclohexanol here. And it looks like from the search results, we've got the um, Wikipedia search results here with cyclohexanol giving us the molar mass, which is something I need for this. So for the molar mass for cyclohexanol, that was 100.158. And I'm going to actually go ahead and do a theoretical value here because we're going to need this for one of the questions a little bit later. So for the mass, let's just say 5 grams. Yours is going to be a little bit different from the video. Make sure you use the data from the video, not this data that I have right here. But we need to calculate this so we know about how much amber is 15 to add. And then for moles, now that I've got um, the mass and molecular weight, I can calculate moles. So we've got 5 grams and 100.158, 100.158. Grams per one mole. I've got grams on the bottom, so grams cancels. I'm left with mole. And this is going to be about 0 0.05. So 5 over 100 is about 0 0.05. So this is about 0 0.05, and let's say 50 moles. So this will be useful then when we calculate what we need to down towards the bottom. And just so that we can finish this, so it looks like the boiling point is 162, the melting point is 26, so the boiling point is 162, and the melting point is 26 degrees Celsius. And then also on there we have the density of 962 kilograms per meter cubed, so the density that times 10 to the negative third power. So 0.962 grams per milliliter is the density. Um, when you calculate this, so your numbers are going to be just slightly different from this, um, but hopefully we do agree that your moles calculated for cyclohexanol will be your limiting reagent. So that is what will, that is equal to the number of moles cyclohexene for your theoretical yield. You can use that and the molecular weight of cyclohexene then to calculate the mass. One common mistake that I see is people finding the molecular weight for cyclohexane, which hopefully we all agree that cyclohexane looks like this, and that is not the same thing as cyclohexene, which looks like that. So you definitely need your alkene, you need your sp2 hybridized carbons, and you need to make sure you say cyclohexene with an E in it and not an A in it when you find that molecular weight. All right, going down to this question here, this really just asks you to explain some of the similarities and differences between amberless 15 and sulfuric acid. So for sulfuric acid, we've got two alcohol functional groups. We've got two double bonded oxygens. So this sulfuric acid compound is very similar in structure essentially from that bond down. So this area here is the exact same thing as that area there. So you could guess that this proton there is going to be very acidic, very similar in acidity level to this of sulfuric acid. Now this is connected to a polymer chain. So these carbon-carbon bonds are connecting themselves, which is really what allows amberless 15 to be in that bead form. We actually have a polymer in solution, which doesn't dissociate into that solution, which is convenient for workup sake and reusability later. Um, but let's go into a little bit more for the mechanism of this. So we have our amberless 15, and that is going to interact with our starting material, cyclohexanol. So for this reaction, when these two interact, this is going to be our acidic proton here. This alcohol functional group will act as a weak base. We're going to 
take that proton. That does not get us to our product. That gets us to an intermediate where now we have a good leaving group. which can really do what's the first step of the E1 reaction that you've covered in your textbook. So for the first step of the E1 reaction or an SN1 reaction, that leaving group leaves, and that gets us to a carbocation intermediate. So we've got a positive charge on that carbon at this point. Now, once water leaves, we need to find the strongest base that we have in solution so we can form our alkene. So looking at water versus our deprotonated amberless 15, water is going to be our stronger base. Once we have this, then we need to take a proton and form our alkene. So we've got um, a few different proton options. So we've got two hydrogens right here. We have a hydrogen right here. We've got two hydrogens right here. And just as a quick note, four of these five all work. I'm going to show you the mechanism for the one that doesn't work and explain why it doesn't work, so please do not show this as your mechanism. Um, eventually, what we want to get to is our cyclohexene product, but if we take the wrong proton, we're not going to get there. So if we use our weak base to deprotonate this one right here, which is the wrong one, and we form our alkene, that will not get us there. What that would actually get us to is... So we formed our alkene. We still have two protons on this carbon. So now this carbon right here has five bonds. And now we don't have a proton on there, so that still has a positive charge. These electrons were shared between the carbon and hydrogen. Now they're shared between the carbon and carbon. So there's no difference in charge on that carbon right there. And not only do we have five bonds there, we've got more electrons on this carbon, so we'd actually have a negative charge there. So in summary, this is a mess, and that does not form. And when we deprotonate from our carbocation intermediate, you never take from the actual carbocation um, because we essentially are not filling the octet again. So the goal is to form that compound. In reality, though, if we have some acid in solution, such as the acidic byproduct of this, so H3O+, plus, you could think that this alkene could easily take that proton. You could form this carbocation, and instead of water taking a proton, we could just attack that carbocation to get to here, and then our weak base water could deprotonate that to get us back to our cyclohexanol. So the way that we're driving this reaction to completion, the way that we are making this reaction go to as much product as possible, is by once this forms, we literally remove it. We literally distill it over into our collection flask. Um, in this case, in this experiment, I think once we get into lab, we'll see that we're collecting that into a small test tube. So we're literally adding this to our test tube, taking it out of the equation so that we can continue driving this reaction in that direction. Now, in this experiment, you are asked to um, add 5 grams of cyclohexanol, even though cyclohexanol is a liquid. So usually that's measured by volume. The reason we ask you to add grams is because let's say you added whatever the appropriate calculated volume was, something close to five milliliters of cyclohexanol in your graduated cylinder. The problem is once you pour this into the round bottom flask of the reaction, so when this gets poured into this round bottom flask, you've got some liquid still adhering to the glass of this graduated cylinder. So there's no way you're gonna be able to transfer all of it unless you did something like wash it with a solvent. But in this case, we're not using a solvent in this reaction, so that wouldn't be a possible option, which is why it makes sense. Instead of measuring that out, we're just going to take a dropper and take our cyclohexanol right from its original source and then drop that right into our round bottom flask. All right, and then finally, we need to figure out how much amberless 15 is ideal to use in this reaction. So we're given several ratios here 
and told essentially what our percent recovery of cyclohexene is. So it looks like from this table, when we use quite a bit of amberlis 15 relative to our cyclohexanol starting material, we have a lower yield than if our amberlis 15 decreases in molar quantity until we get to the point where we don't have hardly any amberlis 15 and then we start to decrease our yield again. So this is the ideal ratio that we want to use and we want to apply that to this reaction. Now, based on the table that we've already filled out, we know that we actually have 0.05 moles of cyclohexanol. So again, we are using 0.050 moles of cyclohexanol. So thinking about this, we know that the ratio of 0.015 moles of amberlis 15 to one mole of our cyclohexanol. So that's OH, this is our acid catalyst, amberlis 15. So this is our cyclohexanol, this is our acid catalyst, amberlis 15. That's the ideal molar ratio. So how can we duplicate that molar ratio within this experiment? Well, we need to figure out how much of the acid catalyst we need to use, so we can substitute that for X because we don't know how much that is yet. But we do know exactly how many moles of cyclohexanol we're using, and that is 0 0.050 moles of cyclohexanol. So now we can solve for X. So we can take our 0 0.015 over 1, which is 0 0.015, and then multiply that by 0 0.05 to figure out the number of moles of our amberlis 15 that we need to use. When you calculate that, you're going to see that it's a very small number and it might have made more sense for that table to be in millimoles, but essentially that value that you calculate is this value right here. So this is the value that we just calculated within that equation. Now I didn't show you the answer to that, but I think you can calculate it from that point. And then once you calculate that number of moles, you can use the molecular weight of amberlis 15 to figure out the ideal mass that we should have added. Now I think you'll see if you keep the number of appropriate sig figs that what was used in the experiment is just slightly different from that. So I think that'd be something good to discuss in your discussion. In lab we saw that when we have Br2, if we add that to anything, if we added that to water, there's not going to be a reaction there. But over time this is going to dissociate and or undergo radical reactions. So there'll be a light color fade regardless of what this is added to. But if we add this to cyclohexene, we definitely will do an addition reaction where our alkene interacts with our bromine and we end up with a dibrominated or a dibromo cyclohexene, which this is colorless. And I apologize for the error that I drew there. There's a better arrow. So Br2 plus cyclohexene is going to go to this, which is colorless. Br2 plus cyclohexanol will probably do a radical reaction or two, but mostly if you add a little bit of cyclohexanol to your Br2 solution, it's just going to dilute it a little bit. So you don't expect to see much color change with that. And finally, let's do a brief discussion about IR analysis. So for IR analysis, looking at this, and based on what we know about this experiment, what I see here is an alcohol functional group. So this broad stretch from about 3,000 to 3,600 is our broad stretch, which is our alcohol functional group, which has hydrogen bonding potential, which is what broadens that stretch. For a lot of organic compounds, we expect to see some sp3 hybridized ch stretching just below the 3000 mark so looking at our compounds this looks like it would have oh stretching so the hydrogen oxygen bond of an alcohol functional group is expected to be around 31 to 3600 if you're writing this down it's best to represent this as a stretch within that range so here, instead of saying 3331, which is probably about what that right there is, these broad stretches should be given a range. So this would be 
um, 3100 to 3600 for that number right there. Now within this range here, this is also given there's a range in your table, but it's okay to specify what those numbers are. So you would essentially list 2932 and 2855 as the two major absorbances within that region to specify the fact that we have several sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretches. Now looking at this, what I don't see is the carbon carbon stretch. So I don't see anything around 1600 that would be in this region here. I don't see that on here. So I know that we do not have a cyclohexene. Now there's no guarantee that this OH stretch is for sure the OH of cyclohexanol. If you have some water in your um, whatever compound that you're testing, that's going to show up. So there's no guarantee that this is what we have. Um, so you need to look at basically the rest of the um, question and think about that and then also look at your starting material and product from this reaction. Think about all the variables within that. But those are just some general ideas of what we see. Um, another thing is the SP3CH bending is just below 1500. So another stretch that you would definitely want to mark with this is the bending that's happening, essentially the bending of that bond and that bond there back and forth to give us this absorbance here. So the three main things that you see on this table are the OH stretch, the sp3 hybridized CH stretch, and the sp3 hybridized CH bend. I do not see anything relative to an alkene, and that's really the other thing that we were thinking about making for this reaction.